Hello everyone. Welcome to this session where we're going to be looking at communicating the impacts of uncertainty when modelling coastal flood hazards. I hope you're going to enjoy this session. I'm joined by many experts from different career stages. So I'm going to have a number of talks to start the session, followed by a discussion. The talks will be by Charlotte Lydon from Bangor University, Sanna Maus from VA, VU Amsterdam, Dr Matthew Palmer from the Met Office, and then we'll be joined by Professor Ben Goulby from HR Wallingford. In the background, we'll also have Ben Phillips helping us monitor the Q&A. So I'm hoping that everyone will be using the function on the website to ask questions from the start of this session as you hear the talks. This is a very important session because with rising sea level and climate change, coastal flooding is becoming more and more hazardous and we need to use models to predict what's happening both now and in the future. So hopefully you've got lots of questions to ask our experts and you'll enjoy the initial presentations. So our first presentation is going to be by Charlotte Lydon. Hello there, my name is Charlotte Lydon. I work as a postdoc at Bangor University and I'll be starting our series of presentations with an overview of the drivers of coastal flooding hazards and starting to explain what we mean when we talk about uncertainty. The UK's National Risk Register captures the range of emergencies that might have a major impact on all or significant parts of the UK. Coastal flooding is rated as the second highest risk of civil emergency in the UK after pandemic influenza. Coastal zones worldwide are subject to short term local variations in sea level due to astronomical tides, storm surges, wind, waves and rivers. These drivers can combine to potentially exceed critical thresholds such as sea defences and pose a flooding hazard to coastal communities. When these drivers occur together or in close succession, they compose a disproportionately large flooding hazard. The example time series on the left shows the biggest event to impact the east coast of the UK in the last 50 years, with a large storm surge occurring close to the time of tidal high water. The right plot shows three concurrent peak river discharges also coinciding with tidal high water. Coastal flooding was experienced during both of these events. Flooding poses a threat to life, infrastructure, ecosystems and disruption to essential services, particularly energy and transport. There's a need to understand how these drivers combine under current climate conditions and where this could result in flooding to help to inform local scale flood hazard assessments, inform alternative management plans and future adaptation strategies. Monitoring data is crucial to help to understand when and where these drivers can combine to increase flood hazard under current climate conditions. A comprehensive network of tide gauges, river gauges and wave buoys captures high temporal resolution data. Innovative instruments including wave overtopping sensors plus cameras and laser scanners are being deployed to observe these drivers at the coast right where the impact is felt. These provide invaluable data sets that can be used for real time flood alerts and can be used to drive and validate another tool in the coastal scientists arsenal to understand coastal flooding hazards, numerical modelling tools. Numerical modelling tools are important components of local flood hazard assessments as they can help to understand how and when extreme tides, surges, wind, waves and river discharge could combine to generate a hazard at the coast. Some models are as simple as a bathtub inundation model on the left that assumes an area with an elevation less than a projected flood level will be flooded like a bathtub. Others simulate the movement of water over terrain under the influence of gravity based on physical processes. And these are termed process based models. For example, on the right is a simulated flooding scenario at Albury on Severn in southwest England as a result of an extreme tide and storm surge coinciding at the time of high water. These models help to show which areas will flood based on how water moves 
the height of the land and defences and can show the depth and extent of flooding. But different approaches to simulating coastal flooding hazards will generate different results. The misrepresentation of physical processes and complex interactions in models or variability in the representation of terrain or offshore boundary conditions used to force models can lead to a wide spread of results and potentially render their value in flood hazard assessments less useful. These are known as epistemic uncertainties, which can occur in model results due to imperfect knowledge. These uncertainties can be a problem for coastal managers and policymakers who rely on accurate predictions for the design of coastal defences, early warning systems and evacuation orders. For example, model setup and input data can have a significant impact on model results. This figure shows significant wave height at high water along the shoreline of the Severn Estuary, Southwest England and South Wales for the most extreme event on record. Significant wave height is simulated with different input and model setups. This was part of a research project to quantify the impacts of uncertainty on coastal hazard modelling. So the different coloured lines represent different wind and wave inputs to the model and different setups to represent interactions between wind, waves and water level. The results confirm that there is sensitivity to different model setups and inputs. For example, not including wind underestimates wave predictions up to half a metre and two wave feedbacks between water level and waves can simulate higher wave heights at the coast. This is a fully validated model, so not modelling the same wave height that actually happened could lead to an error in subsequent analysis. And putting this into practical terms, a 50% error between a predicted and observed wave height is the same as being 30 minutes late in a one hour car journey. So wave and water level outputs from the model runs on the previous slide sensitivity test were used to force an inundation model at a location in the upper Severn estuary. This tests how variation in predicted water level and wave heights can influence the depth and extent of inundation. Simulations six and eight represent the most complex model setups with tide, surge, wind and wave forcing, but differ based on the representation of feedbacks between tide and waves in the model. Both show greatest and similar extent of coastal flooding, but small variations in depth exist between them. So flood inundation is sensitive to small changes in the drivers of flood hazard, as simulated in a regional hydrodynamic model. So improved quantification of uncertainty in inundation assessments can aid long-term coastal flood hazard mitigation. And to increase confidence in knowledge of how coastlines will respond to future changes in sea level. Thanks for listening. And shortly, the first interactive element of this session, a word cloud, will be launched for you to populate with words or phrases to express what you think is the biggest uncertainty in current coastal hazard modelling. I have included some examples here, um, such as type of model, bathymetry, terrain. Um, but please add your answers. The more a word or phrase is entered in response to this question, then the bigger and bolder the word appears in our word cloud. Thank you for that presentation, Charlotte. Um, so she's nicely defined uh, uncertainty for us and given us some thoughts around the background of what where flood hazards come from. So as Charlotte finished up in her presentation, there is a word cloud that you can access through the website. Uh, we want you to put in your words so we can see what is the biggest uncertainty in current coastal um, hazard modelling and what you feel this is. So maybe it's the bathymetry, maybe it's the wave overtopping, uh, what words come to mind? So it's over to you guys who are listening uh, to fill up our word cloud with your words. And I shall also ask the word cloud to be uh, shown on the screen. Also, it's kicked off with lack of observational data, bathymetries on there.
If you agree with the word, please type it again because then it will come out um, and that will be a much larger word. So we know who's agreeing. Well, boundary conditions has jumped out now. There seem to be three key topics that are coming up. Uh, bathymetry, extremes and lack of observed data. So I'm wondering, is that observed data for data assimilation or is it observed data for model validation? Boundary condition seems to have returned now. And of course, you can always have another go. If your words are made small, enter them again. Oh, I've just been told by the technical people you only get one vote, so you'll have to ask your friend to enter it if you want that word made larger. OK, the word cloud will only probably be live for another minute, so get those votes in, get those words changing. OK, the words don't seem to be changing much now. It looks like extremes are standing out. So you've got a couple of seconds to get those words in and then we'll probably re-look re at this uh, when we come to the discussion after the next presentation. So I'm, I'm going to give you a countdown to get your last few words in. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one. OK, we're closing the word cloud now. So on that note, um, we're going to move on to our next presenter, Sana, and she's going to be looking more at identifying uncertainty in future simulations when we're modelling coastal flood hazards. So if we could play the next presentation, please, that would be great. Good afternoon. My name is Sana Maus and I work as a sea level scientist. And in the past eight years, I've been investigated the climate change impact on coastal flooding. And today I'll give you a brief summary of how we do this and what are the main sources of uncertainty. But first I'll explain what drives coastal flooding. Coastal flooding is caused by extreme sea levels, which are composed of mean sea level, astronomical tides, storm surges and waves. And all of these sea level components act on different spatial and temporal scales. So for example, where mean sea level is a large scale process, which, which varies on seasonal to centennial timescales, storm surges and waves are caused by extreme weather, 
and are often generated more locally and last a couple of hours or days. In the tropics, tropical cyclones are the main threat that caused extremes. In other regions, it's often the coincidence of different events. So for example, a storm which passes during high spring tides. And all of these sea level components may be impacted by climate change. Perhaps the most well-known impact of climate change is sea level rise. Sea level, sea level rise will raise the mean and will directly lead to an increased frequency of coastal flood. But a warmer climate is also expected to affect wind patterns and storm characteristics, which in turn may also impact storm surges and waves. This is, for example, the case for tropical cyclones. In a warmer ocean, with a warmer ocean, they may be able to intensify faster and travel more north and consequently result in changes in extremes. An additional effect is that all of the sea level components also interact with each other. And any change in the mean may also have an impact on tides, for example. And this may also be important to consider. And all of these processes that are just mentioned can be simulated with high dynamical models. A hydrodynamic model can simulate water levels. It takes input from climate models. So in this case, atmospheric pressure and wind speed. And then using a chain of models, including statistical models, we can compute the probability of extreme events. So in this global map here depicts the one in 1000 year return level. So the water levels that correspond to return period of 1000 years. And as you can see, there's a large space of variability. With, for example, in the Mediterranean, which has few storms and uh, very low tides, extremes typically uh, below half a meter. In the North Sea, we see much higher extremes, which are linked to the high tidal range and the, st the storms that pass. And then a key question is how this frequency may change into the future. And then ma this map here, you see when, so by which year, the frequency of a one in 100 year event will start to occur annually. And with the dark purple colors indicate regions where this may already occur by 2040. And as you can see, locations in low latitude regions, uh, away from tropical cyclones, this may already happening by 2030, 2040. And this is because in those regions, there's a very minor variability in extremes. And consequently, even a small change in the mean uh, may have a big impact. So what are the main drivers of, of changing coastal flooding? Um, at a global scale, it will for sure be sea level rise. It will drive the large scale changes and, and, and drive increased coastal flooding. But at a local scale, changes in extreme weather and interaction between different sea level components may also be important to consider. But any projection that we make will be uncertain and is surrounded by different sources of uncertainties. These sources um, can arrive from the data input that we use, so the data from climate models, which, for example, typically underestimate the intensity of tropical cyclones, model errors, so any hydrodynamic model may lack resolution, um, for example, in regions with a complex coastline or where there's also river flow into the ocean. Then there's scenario uncertainty. So any projection that we make will be based on a certain climate scenario, which by itself is uncertain. And a key challenge when projecting changes in extreme is the large internal variability of the climate system. Um, any change in extreme that we project is often of similar magnitude of the internal variability, which makes it very difficult. And then another challenge is that many of the climate models will show different outcomes. So if we run the same experiment with different climate models, one model may say that storm changes will increase, another one may say for the same locations, we'll see a decrease. So this is important to use multiple models and to see where models agree and where they disagree to address this uncertainty. And in general, we have to be aware that while we may be able to constrain some of these centered uncertainties, others we will have to accept um, and are not easy to solve. And we have to realize that uncertainty is not a completely new phenomenon. Extremes have always been uncertain. Often we have used 20, 30 years of data to estimate very low probability events. Um, for example, um, 
the landfall of a tropical cyclone. And flood risk managers have been able to deal with this. The difference now is that we see it coming. Um, and I see several phases forward to address the uncertainties. I think we have to exploit the full potential of, of new methods, such as machine learning, high performance computing, and make use of the petabytes of data that have been generated by the next generation of climate models. And we have to collaborate. So we have to design coordinated model experiments and work together to really investigate deeply what's going on and what will happen based on the information that we have available. Um, an important aspect of this is that we have to open up our data and code so we can really learn from each other and we can speed up the scientific advances. And then finally, I think we need to be clear and communicate about the limitations of our models and our projections, and also be transparent about what we cannot know. Um, in the next few years, we have to take this, the, the decisions um, based on uncertain, an uncertain future. Um, and we have to find days, ways to fuel, to deal with that uncertainties. This map displays the additional people at risk in the coming decades um, at a one in 100 year flood. And it shows that in Asia, but also in Europe and other regions, we will see very large increases. And it shows there's a necess necessity to commit to adaptation. Despite the wide uncertainties, we have to take actions and we have to protect these millions of people that are at risk of coastal flooding. And with that, I'd like to end my presentation and I look forward to a very interesting session. Thanks. There we go, another good presentation all about uncertainty. I hope people are typing their questions into the Q&A so we've got something to discuss at the end. Um, we're now going to get you involved again with the poll. This will have three questions. Um, we'll bring it up on screen now. So through the website, you'll be asked three questions relating to understanding uncertainty. So if you can go onto the poll uh, and vote for your options, vote for your answers. can see those answers coming in nicely now. You've only got a couple of more minutes to get your answers in.
Okay, has everybody got their answers in? Again, we'll be coming back to these results and having a look at them in, in the discussion. Um, so last few seconds to click your, your votes. Every time I think it stopped changing, someone submits another answer. OK, I think we'll uh, close that poll now and we'll move on to the final presentation. The final presentation is by Matt Palmer and he's going to be talking about communicating uncertainty to stakeholders and, un and end users. So if we can roll the next presentation, that would be great. I'm going to give you some quick insights into communicating flood hazard uncertainty based in the work that we did as part of UK CP18. So the projections of future sea level rise focused on mean sea level change, which is the dominant driver of coastal flood risk over the 21st century based on current scientific understanding. So throughout this presentation, we'll be looking at a low emission scenario, RCP 2.6, and a high emission scenario, RCP 8.5. And here's some projections of global sea level uh, with the various components indicated, which form the, the kind of bedrock of the regional projections we provided for the UK. So we combine that information with some other processes and we can come up with site specific projections around the UK. So you can see um, an indication of how sea level the projections at 2100 vary. And we also have some sense of the overall uncertainty that across the three uh, greenhouse gas emission scenarios that we selected for that work. If we take an example projection for Newlyn Cornwall, this is typically how we might visualize that with a tide gauge record shown in black. And then we have a couple of the, the low emissions and high emission scenario. An analysis of that can tell us what the dominant drivers are on, on a range of timescales moving out. So we can see that early on in the period, actually local sea level variability is a big part of the overall um, projection uncertainty. And then towards the end of, this, of the 21st century, the, the um, scenario becomes a big, a much bigger part of it. And throughout the modeling uncertainty, so the, the estimated uncertainties from the various sea level processes are a big part of the uncertainty picture. So the projection uncertainties, which are represented by the shaded bands in the previous plot, um, they really characterize the center part of the distribution and so in particular, um, one of the issues for communication is this, um, this upper tail. And the tail risk, um, what, or what we call the tail risk, cannot be robustly quantified based on present scientific understanding. And so that presents a challenge of how, we, of how we represent and talk about this to stakeholders. So what about longer time scales? Um, as part of UK CP18, uh, we developed some extended projections that went all the way to 2300. So I'm showing you the global mean sea level change for, for the low emission scenario on the left and the high emission scenario on the right. Um, so And note that there's a different uh, y-axis scale on the left and right panels. But essentially what we can see is the uncertainties are even larger on these longer time horizons. But these longer time horizons also illustrate um, that there's a minimum amount of adaptation that we will need to be prepared for even under um, a low emissions future. So I've overplotted here the AR6 projections for the equivalent um, SSP scenarios. And we can see that while, while the two sets of projections agree well up to 2150, the, the assessment of uh, the range of projected future sea level rise at 2300 in, in AR6 is substantially larger than the new KCP18, as shown by these uh, yellow bars at the ends. So in addition to this, AR6 considered a low likelihood high impact storyline, uh, and they said that they can't, um, sea, sea level rise in excess of 15 meters can't be ruled out under a high emissions uh, scenario. So one of the nice presentations in AR6 was changing the way that the information was presented. 
And so in this example, um, they considered the timing, the projected timing of sea level rise milestones. So how quickly might, why, might we see a one meter or a two meter rise of sea level under different scenarios? The other thing that they've done here is shown the different strands of evidence and how they support that timing. And you can see different levels of agreement between those different strands of evidence and different time ranges for them. So using this sort of information, I think uh, one of the useful ways that the community is starting to go is in the development of physically based storylines. Um, so trying to pick a range of uh, a range of future narratives that, that, that kind of illustrate the different possibilities without necessarily having to give uh, a quantitative estimate of the likelihood of that outcome. Excellent. So thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I'm hoping you're all getting some Q&A, uh, getting your questions posed ready for the discussion because that will be the next part of this session. So we are now going to run another poll. Um, so we're going to get your views on another three questions. This time we're going to be looking at communicating uncertainty. So if we could get the poll running, please, that would be great. can see the first answers are coming in. Everyone's voted for the same answer again initially. OK, keep getting those answers in because you'll only have a couple more minutes. OK, we'll have a few more seconds so you can get your final votes in and then we'll have all of our presenters on screen to take your questions and uh, have a discussion.
Okay, the uh, poll is about to be closed, so get clicking last couple of seconds. And I think we'll move into the discussion session. Okay, so now you can see all of our presenters and they've also been joined by Ben Goulby. Um, so these are your experts, so feel free to pitch as many difficult questions or easy questions as you would like at them. So to kick off the discussion, we're actually going to first of all look at the word cloud to see what was the um, key ingredient that creates uncertainty that you, the audience, think we need to be looking at. So if I could ask for the word cloud to be up on screen. Oh, it's not ready yet. OK, so we won't worry about that. Um, what we'll do, we'll have a, I'll ask the everybody who's been presenting what they think their biggest source of uncertainty is within their own modelling expertise. So if anyone would like to unmute, feel free to jump in. Shall I uh, offer a view? Jenny? Go for it, Ben. So, well, I have to declare at the outset, I've got a bit of an advantage because we, we have done a very specific study that has been trying to answer this question. And um, uh, this was a study we undertook for the Environment Agency where we were looking at uncertainty from lots of different sources within a coastal flood uh, risk modelling chain. So we were looking at multivariate extremes. We were looking at um, the uncertainty associated when we, we extrapolate to extreme values, looking at uncertainties associated with wave transformation models, surf zone models, and then overtopping models. So, so in the analysis, um, we propagated these uncertainties through the modeling system and came out with probability distributions of overtopping rates and uh, economic damages. And um, for, for me, some of the results we, we found uh, were quite surprising because when when we completed the uncertainty analysis, we also undertook a, a formal sensitivity analysis. So we were able to measure which of the input uncertainties was contributing most to the output uncertainties. And there's a there's a pie chart we we got um, slide eleven, I think it is, that shows the individual contributions and. The results of our analysis showed that it was the uncertainty in the overtopping model that was uh, by far and away dominating the uncertainty um, that was coming out of the, the modelling chain. So we undertook that analysis on three different sites and obviously the results are applicable to those individual sites, but um, in general terms we, we came to similar conclusions in terms of the, the relative contributions um, at each of those different sites. So yeah, this was the um, pie chart that essentially shows which source of input certainty contributes most to the output uncertainty. And uh, the gray bit of the pie there is, is the most dominant source and that is associated with the wave overtopping model. So, so that was an outcome of our, our analysis, which when I saw these results, I was quite surprised. I thought uh, like many of the people contributing today that extremes, when you extrapolate extreme values, um, that would be a, a very significant source of uncertainty. But that's not um, what we found here. And in fact, the multivariate extremes is a relatively small bit of the pie there. That's the, the red area. So um, yeah, that's, that's just some thoughts on a, a recent bit of analysis that was done for the Environment Agency. So I'm going to bring everybody back on screen now. Um, 
from the word cloud, the three biggest words were extremes, lack of observer, observed data, and boundary conditions. So uh, let's have a think about those. So Ben's already mentioned extremes, um, but what about lack of observed data? From our own modeling, uh, what type of observations do we require? Because we have a lot of wave buoys, we have tide gauges, we have weather stations. Um, so are we talking about observed data within the, the flood zone itself? Okay, go for it, Charlotte. I can take this one, Jenny. Um, yeah, it's interesting um, that you mentioned the kind of high density that we have of observation data in some parts of the coast. So you mentioned we have a lot of tide gauges, but these, we have a lot of tide gauges in the UK, but far fewer in the southern hemisphere, for example. Um, if I continue thinking about the UK, um, we have a lot of wave boys, a lot of river gauges, um, but these aren't necessarily located at at the coast where we see the greatest impact. Um, so a lot of the time we need more data kind of at the coastline to show how these offshore conditions propagate to the shoreline to impact infrastructure, communities, people, ecosystems. Um, I think that there's also a need to understand maybe which areas have flooded in the past, um, what areas might flood again, um, could flood in the future as well. So it's just building up a kind of really strong um, network of data to show what the impacts have been in the past and then what they could be in the future. Um, I'd be interested to hear if anyone else has anything to add. So I'm going to add to what Charlotte said. Uh, so I'm interested in where flood water might go. Um, but also in the ability to add nowcast information into our forecasting services. So maybe when we're thinking about river flooding, um, how do we get information about where debris is within a river? Uh, can debris clog up the flow under a bridge? And then does the flooding look different to a, a flood forecast model? Um, also about how, does, how do waves um, over top sea defences it's very rare to get observations in the field. Um, we normally work in flumes and uh, gather information in laboratories rather than actually in the real world. So getting more data um, into models in real time, but also to validate the tools we use is going to be very important, I think, in the future. But I'm not sure if any of our other speakers would like to add anything on that topic. Yep, yeah, Matt. So I, so I can say a few things. Um, so just to remind everyone, that I, I, I guess I'm more at the mean kind of sea level projection side of things. So, um, but certainly in terms of the tide gauge measurements, they are still relatively sparse along the coastline. And actually, um, we could do with some uh, additional, as much additional observations as we can possibly get in terms of understanding what. Um, what are the controlling processes of those tide gauge records? So vertical land motion is a very important process locally that often we don't have any um, kind of uh, observations of. And so I think if, um, you know, there is a lot more work to do in terms of understanding the site specific uh, sea level projections in the context of what the observed processes are and those changes we're seeing today without both of those two things, I, I think it puts us in, in a difficult situation. So I definitely think there's a strong call for improved um, observations. And when I think about the sea level projections as a whole, then of course there are many different processes at both global and local scale. So we think about the ice sheet processes and how important they are to the projections. And then the, the ocean circulation processes and how important they are to the projections. There's, there's really, um, it's a really complex system and sea level really does integrate all of these different processes and all of them require observations to understand the observed changes in order to build better models and have more confidence in those projections in the future. But while we're talking about observations, um, maybe this is a, a good time to say, well, what do people think about citizen science and how can we integrate that into um, flood hazard modelling?
Yeah, so, so I'll make a couple of comments um, just in relation to what you were saying about flood forecasting and thinking about coastal flood forecasting. What, one of the, the challenges is um, relates to beach levels, which can heavily influence wave overtopping rates. And it's, it's obviously, we, we have reasonable archives of uh, beach profiles that have been measured, but um, we don't always have accurate and up-to-date information relating to beach levels. And um, as I say, this can be important for coastal flood forecasting. And there's been a number, number of times I've heard a suggestion about um, citizen data gathering in terms of uploading photos of um, benchmarks and beach levels at, at different locations to have a much more real-time feel to the collation of uh, beach levels is just one of the potential I examples that, that uh, could prove helpful in the future. So that's making me think of the International Coast Snap project um, where posts are installed around the coastline for people to locate their smartphones and cradles and capture geolocated images of the beach. And then these images can be processed over time to see how beaches evolve. Um, so that is a growing network um, that many people are getting involved in. So I guess the question is, how do we start um, taking the data from those images and actually getting them into our wave over topping uh, tools maybe? Um, at the minute, they're used as observations on their own. Coastal managers are using them for beach management. Um, but how do we start integrating that type of data into our models? So maybe it's now um, a good time to have a look at uh, the results from the polls as all the answers are in. So if we could maybe get the results up on screen. And I'm also going to uh, pass over to Charlotte to talk through the answers that you've given us. Great, thank you, Jenny. Um, I shall hopefully be seeing the word cloud, or you should hopefully also be seeing the word cloud coming up on your screen shortly. There we go. Thank you very much. Um, so as Jenny mentioned, we had um, a couple of words and phrases that came out, um, particularly um, dominant. So we've talked about extremes, um, lack of observed data and boundary conditions. Um, so boundary conditions um, being the data that you use to force your model to drive your model. So whether this is um, using observation data or from a um, model, which is as Sana um, spoke about in her presentation as well. Um, interestingly, if we start looking around kind of some of those smaller words, it maybe shows some of the diversity of the audience here. Um, we've got some people maybe um, interested in estuaries, looking at river inputs, how often uh, are river flows um, introduced into our models and how can that help to um, contribute towards a more thorough understanding of what's happening at our coastlines. Um, let's not forget that, yeah, we don't just have um, hazards coming from the sea, or the ocean, from waves and storm surges, but also um, when you have those coinciding with big river discharge events. Um, we've also got some comments here, which have also been touched on at, on other sessions in this summit, um, tipping points um, and compound hazards. Um, and then also looking at um, comments about elevation data and bathymetry um, as my first presentation showed if you have, well, different um, representations of the terrain of the coastline can change different results as well that you see. Um, OK, maybe we could um, take a look at the polls now, please, and then that might lead on to a couple more um, of our discussion points. OK, so um, when scientists report uncertainty in their data, they are, here we go, quantifying error, um, and variability. Um, that's what I um, would have said, but equally, I think we have a second highest answer of all of the above, um, which is fair enough. Um, I think that sometimes scientists don't like to admit that their results might be incorrect. So that 5% um, maybe is um, the ones who are slightly more honest in their science. Um, have we, can we see the results for the second question, please? Um, OK, so the vast majority um, identify uncertainty as being inherent in nature. Um, 
it's not necessarily avoidable. It's there in a lot of what we do. Um, uncertainty can come from instrumental error. Um, but yeah, I would agree with the audience on that one. Um, and then second, the third one, sorry, please. Um, again, I would agree with the audience on this one as well. Um, uncertainty in scientific results should be reported even when the error is very small. Um, OK, could we have the results from the second poll? OK, um, I find this this result is quite interesting. So I would prefer to know about uncertainty related to climate change from values, certain impacts or probability distribution. Um, so the first two are quite even. So maybe that's um, a representation of the spread of disciplines we have in the audience or kind of related to the background um, that we have um, here. Uh, so this question comes from a recent paper about whether or not um, people like to read about uncertainty um, related to climate change as bounded or unbounded. Um, so bounded is when you maybe have it very specifically related to statistics or unbounded when it's related to um, very certain impacts. Um, so I'd say almost the audience was maybe split on that one. Um, results for the next one, please. OK. Um, easiest to understand uncertainty in flood hazard when it's visualised as a series of maps. Um, interesting, um, as um, some people prefer it described in a narrative as well. Um, maybe a combination of all of those can be quite useful. Um, and then finally, um, the third answer, please. Um, OK, so we've got all of the above relating to the answer um, on this question, um, which is, oh, let me just find, sorry, I can't see the question on here. Um, I find it useful to understand what could happen by considering um, these comments. OK, so thank you all, everyone, for um, answering the questions on the poll. I think relating to those answers on the third one about communicating uncertainty. Um, I'd like to put it to the panel as maybe some of the researchers and scientists putting together these reports on uncertainty and future coastal risks. Um, what do you prefer to visualise uncertainty as? Do you prefer to see it as a series of maps or graphs or in your background, what, how would you normally prefer to present that information? Well, so I can offer a, a few comments here in that um, I think for me, I don't have a personal preference. Um, I, I don't mind seeing uncertainty presented uh, graphically, numerically or in, in different formats. Um, for me, part of the, the, the biggest challenge is um, trying to communicate uncertainty with lots of different um, receivers of that information. So obviously we, we're all very familiar with presenting um, outputs from our analysis uh, to other academics or experts in the industry, but there's a whole different um, category uh, of potential end users in terms of the, the public. And we, I think we need to be careful about um, lumping everybody into one specific category, because obviously um, there's lots of different potential users and we would need to think of different ways um, uncertainty can be, can be communicated to different uh, end user groups. And, and probably, I think if we're honest, as scientists and generators of the information, we're probably not the best people to actually advise on the best ways to communicate the information. And probably we do well to interact with social science scientists and behavioural scientists who are probably much more uh, aligned with how the information would uh, potentially be, be received. So that's just a few uh, thoughts and comments. I can give some thoughts if you like. I mean, I, I agree with a lot of what Ben has said. Um, 
I think that there are different there are different objectives sometimes for the communication of uncertainty. And I think we do need to, I mean, from someone who's more involved in like what, what's kind of called the physical science uh, and, and less involved with impacts, I think it's important that we, we, we're kind of moving towards more of a risk framework when we consider these things. And um, and that does make, the, the risk framing is very context specific and stakeholder specific, depending on what their tolerance is to uncertainty. And so an extreme, um, an, an extreme example of a, a sector that is very that has a very low risk tolerance is uh, the nuclear energy sector, where they really cannot afford to uh, make you know betting against um, a certain given a certain level of sea level rise. They have to be very cautious in how how they do their planning. Whereas for some other for some other kind of applications, you might be able to do to take more of a kind of um, adaptive planning approach where you can afford to do a f first bit of planning see what happens to sea level rise in the environment in the environmental conditions and then plan for that next bit of the future depend and it's a it's quite a complex um i find it quite a complex topic depends on the time scales of interest of the lifetime of the infrastructure its location there's lots and lots of different factors so that's that's one thing i think we need to appreciate Broadly speaking, I think maps are are incredibly powerful ways. I think we are generally much better. Um, it's often as humans easier to receive visual information. It's, it, it stays with us. Um, you know, a picture paints a thousand words, and some of the visuals I saw in some of the talks I thought were really impressive, and and you know they kind of capture the imagination. Um, so I think there's a role for maps really in communicating, but. In terms of the risk, going a bit back to the risk, I think there are two things. There are two things to my mind. I think we really want to think about. So one is where, what is the most kind of likely outcome, or where, where do most of those model trajectories take take us? That's that's given us quite an important piece of information. It's what the science says is kind of among the more likely outcomes sit in this part of the of the trajectory. But the other thing I think we have to have an eye on is what what are those unlikely but high impact outcomes that we really need to bear in mind in the context of our risk framework. So I think, and um, if I can speak for a few seconds longer, I think um, in terms of what those uncertainties are, so it goes back to an earlier question, but it really does depend on the time scale again of, of, of interest. And it varies a lot depending geographically where you are in the world. So not, not everyone or not every location will experience the same sea level drivers, so thinking back to Shanna's uh, talk, but also the uncertainties and the projections will vary uh, considerably geographically. So I'll stop there, thanks. Yeah, maybe if I can respond to that. Um, I agree that a risk framework is can be extremely useful. Um, I myself work at an institute where we both have social scientists, political scientists, as well as physical scientists, and it's uh, sometimes even hard to communicate in the coffee corner. So I think there's already, um, well, it shows how difficult it can be to communicate about your research um, to other people. Um, but one thing that might be difficult when it comes to a risk framework is the more models you add and the more data you add, the more uncertain, uncertain the outcome becomes. And then there may actually be that a lot of the risk modeling, so converting sea level to damages, may add a lot more uncertainty um, than is already there. So it may also make complicate the story a little bit. I'm going to make one last comment and then maybe we should look at some of the Q&A from the audiences. So we're, we're talking a lot about uncertainty here um, and we are being typical scientists. We're thinking about our GIS visualisation graphs um, but also we need to be much more multidisciplinary. Uh, we need to start using perhaps augmented reality when we start talking with the public so they can visualise the impacts of uncertainty. Um, perhaps start using storytelling uh, so people can engage and, and understand and see and kind of feel um, the impacts of uncertainty. So I'm going to now pass Back to Charlotte, um, who's been monitoring the Q&A with Ben, uh, to see what questions you've been asking our panel. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I'm going to ask one which actually relates very much to that topic. We've had 
um, quite a few comments um, coming in, uh, maybe from people who are not necessarily in such a scientific discipline um, as we are, but equally interested in coastal flooding hazards. Um, picking up on a comment that Ben made that we do need to work with social scientists and behavioural scientists, but also arts and humanities professionals, um, graphic designers, uh, researchers in the environmental humanities. Um, I was wondering if anyone on the panel had such experience of that and if you would be willing to share your experiences. Um, well, I'd certainly agree with, um, it, I wasn't trying to be uh, exclusive in the, in the statement about social science, but yes, much wider interaction. Um, from my perspective, to be honest, we have very little um, interaction with with those uh, wider communities and certainly from I think from our side it would be very much welcomed we just not need to find the most uh, appropriate ways to do that but um, for, for me it's, uh, it's there's a real need there so so, so I was uh, I got a little bit involved in a project called Climate Stories that some of you may be aware of that ran in the UK that was um, really designed to be a collaboration between artists and scientists. It was very much on the communication um, uh, side of things, but also just highlighting that, you know, humans are natural storytellers. And I think that is that is a tool in, in the communication. I, I, I don't know, whenever you watch a news story or something, it's much more compelling it's much more compelling when you hear someone's story, I think, about a, a, a given situation. Obviously, there's lots of global news events going on. But I think um, to hear people's climate stories is an interesting thing. Like we will start to see communities kind of being displaced by sea level rise and climate refugees and all this sort of stuff. And I think that will play a big role in uh, the communication and getting people to, uh, to, to, you know, some of the basic messages to kind of hit home. I think it's all very well showing these graphs and like the plots I showed in my talk, um, but it's not as compelling as it as hearing uh, someone's story about how what 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 their future looks like or or what the impacts are on them. So I, I think um, I think there is a really big role uh, for this activity here. Yeah. Okay, well, Charlotte's looking for another question um, because we've mentioned graphs there. I'm going to ask the panel, um, do you think people interpret uh, maps in the same way? So do academics, uh, stakeholder groups, do we all use maps in the same way, flood maps? Um, or do you think we all use them slightly differently? I think, I think Ben's answering, but is on mute. <laughs> Uh, yes, apologies. Um, I, I say I don't know um, the answer to the question. I can I can make a comment ab uh, about what I would call deterministic maps. So these are maps where um, there's an extreme sea level or an extreme wave condition, and a, um, a hydraulic model is run to to produce flood depths, and then the, um, the map that's presented says, oh, these are the flood depths that are associated with a one in 100 year event. Um, for me, those are, are very limited in, in what they represent and they can very easily be confused because many of the other sources of uncertainty are, are not captured in those maps. And so they can give an overly precise representation of actually what is known. So. I think I'd make a comment that I, I'm not sure those are overly helpful in, in communicating the actual risks and, and the hazard, if uh, that makes sense. Matt wants to follow up. Go for it, Matt. So, so I'm going to I'm going to kind of follow up on something I s kind of s I think this links to something I was talking about before, but um, I, I mean. I think maps are very powerful. I agree we need to be careful about how they're interpreted. Um, I think in this session we're hearing a little bit about a, a kind of a cascade of uncertainty. You know, the fact that when you 
keep your modeling chain of things going forward to the to the to the coastal flood hazard you end up in a situation where where it just the un, the uncertainty just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and i think in a communication i think that's uh, really problematic when trying to communicate things actually um so what i like the idea of in um, general and i think this applies as a concept across the board is that of of course, we need to understand something about the plume of uncertainty, but I think it is helpful to pull out specific examples within that plume where we show what happened for that event. And OK, there is some uncertainty in exactly how those how the details of your map might play out. But I think if you can say, um, you know, if you, if you can draw examples from across the uncertainty distribution, I think that's one way of um, trying to get a mess you know perhaps a clearer message across and an approach that appeals to me um but you know uh, there's still work to do in this and i agree there's definitely a role for social science and basically communication specialists in helping um tailor this in fact i was involved in the ipcc ar6 report and they had a lot of support from comm specialists designing some of those key figures that you guys will see in the summary for policymakers of the working group one report and things so a lot of thought and time and effort went into decide you know and, and so it's probably more that needs to be done as well you have to decide what the message is or what the communication is that you're trying to get across and then you design you design the the map or the graph or whatever to convey that and um yeah Maybe I can follow up on that. Um, maybe, um, well, at least from experience, I know that people observe very different things when they look at a map. Um, I mostly work with global modeling of extremes. And whenever they see a map, they look to their own tiny little dot on my map and say, but that value is wrong. And I find it very difficult to relate the different skills. So what may be true on a large scale may not be necessarily the correct value at a very local scale, um, where you look at very different type of questions. Um, and I think as a scientist, it's sometimes hard to do so, but even more so for people um, outside of the academic world. Um, and then maybe, well, one other recent example that, that I'd like to share is, um, that could be a way to communicate, is that recently we run some, uh, together with the KNMI, we run some experiments where we actually used um, an historical event, in this case, a tropical cyclone, um, increase the temperature in the model and rerun the event but with higher sea levels and a warmer climate to see how that historical event may change in their under different um, climate conditions and i think the advantage there is that people can relate to that historical event they know in 2012 i was hit by a tropical cyclone and my house was flooded um, or was maybe nearly flooded but if it would happen again in 10 years um, sea level rise may cause the event to be much more extreme so that may be one of the, of the potential approaches that we have to communicate risk in another way. Excellent. I think I will now ask Charlotte for another audience question. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. Thank you, everyone. Um, we're having some really interesting comments coming in, um, kind of supporting what our panel is saying that you need maybe different methods and particularly different terminology for different audiences. Um, so one question that we've had asks whether the term uncertainty is fit for purpose and is that term maybe interpreted differently by different audiences? Um, I was wondering um, if anyone has any comments on um, the suitability of our terminology that we use um, when trying to communicate flooding hazards. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Sorry, I was jumping in. Um, I mean, I think, again, the ex recent experience with IPCC, which is the closest thing I've done to really try and put information, you know, uh, make it tailored for policymakers. I think the term uncertainty sometimes works against us in that people sometimes, I think, are tempted to think that if something's uncertain, that there's, that there's no information, basically. Oh, it's just, you know, it's kind of uncertain. Um, and so I think there are, it, it, it's kind of good to lead with what you know, I think, and, and don't give the impression that this is all the stuff we don't know. I think we tend to do that as scientists. We want to get the caveats up, up kind of out up front. Uh, um, and I think it's actually more helpful if we say what we do know. 
Um, and, and you have to work hard at that um, <laughs> to, you know, to understand what the science, you know, what what are the robust elements? And, and, and there's virtually always robust elements, right? There are things that we can say that we actually know pretty well. And we might not be sure on some of the details, but often the big picture we do actually know pretty well. Um, so, yeah, I, I think um, certainly there is, I totally agree with the reporting that you, you, you did on the comments that come in from the, from the audience around tailoring the messaging a bit and being aware of the words, you know, uh, terminology means different things to a, to a scientist than it does to a policymaker or a person in the street or, or, or depending what your scientific discipline is. So I think we do need to be aware of that. Agree. Thank you, Matt. Um, do any of our other panellists have anything they'd like to add to uh, Matt? Uh, well, just to, to agree that terminology is, is very important and again, needs to reflect the um, the people the communication is, is directed at because everybody can interpret things differently. So yeah, I just uh, agree with with those comments. Go ahead, Jenny. I think you were going to speak up. Uh, I, I just noticed there was a comment about um, global data centres. Uh, so I was going to change the direction of the conversation uh, and talk a little bit about available data. Um, so I know that a lot of nations have their own data centres. Model data, observational data goes into these centres. Um, there are forecasting services that are available, run very often run by government agencies. But I'm not actually aware of a, a global data center that integrates all of this information together. Um, so being in the UK, I would know where to look for um, extremes and uh, events that have occurred here. Um, but I don't think I would know where to look if I was doing a study overseas somewhere. So I don't know if anyone's got any comments uh, to make about where, where you obtain a, a data that could be used for flood hazard research. Well, just to make a few comments, so um, as an organisation, we do uh, flood risk modelling in different parts of the world, and um, there are some global data sets, so you can obtain open source DTM data for your in flood inundation models, for example. Um, but it, also, um, organisations like the uh, Met Office and NOAA have global wave models that you can extract hindcast data from. But a lot of the, the data on things like flood defences or sea levels, etc., is is held locally in uh, local government agencies, for example. So I think it depends on which particular source of data. But then obviously there are publications and uh, reports involving um, studies that have done global scale flood risk analyses and that can give you a very high level overview of um, uh, coastal flood risk at a, at a global scale. Yeah, maybe I can add to that. I think the previous replies already show that you need to be quite an expert to know where to look for data. Um, and there are several organizations that provide also global inf information about coastal flood risk. Uh, but it's a bit scattered and you have to know where to find it. So um, I think that's definitely something that um, makes it a bit complicated uh, for the general public. Because, yeah, I, I don't think not everyone knows where to find the right scientific publication and to go to the da right data repository um, to look for climate data or to look for coastal flood maps. It's been an interesting uh, comment following the discussion we were just having before this one, uh, commenting that um, the terms return period is actually one of the most difficult terminologies to use. Um, so should it be annual probability? Should it be return periods? People that are familiar with that uh, automatically use that terminology. 
So I don't know if anyone wants to comment on um, how we quantify extremes and how we should be talking about extremes. Well, I'm, I'm happy to make a, a comment on that. Um, we just in the process of, of publishing a paper specifically on this this topic and but for me I think it's one of the most uh, confused uh, confusing communication bits of terminology that's that's used and I think for me a lot of the confusion um, comes about because of this distinction between what we would call deterministic modeling and risk-based probabilistic modeling. So uh, traditionally, return period is um, expressed in terms of extreme sea levels or um, extreme river flows. But in a, in a risk-based paradigm, return period relates to consequences of, of flooding. And when we look at real flood events that occur, um, if we were to look at a, a coastal flood event and we would try to characterize that in a, terms of a return period of a sea level, it would be very difficult to give a, a single number because the extreme sea level would vary all the way around the coastline. But in a risk-based analysis, um, what you do is integrate all of the uncertain variables into a, a single consequence variable. And really, it's the only rational way to to put a historic flood event into context. But it's not not something that's done uh, routinely. Quite often, a, a deterministic approach is is used. So for me, I think if even a simple thing of um, clarifying whether you're talking about a deterministic return period or a risk-based uh, return period would would help. But it's, it is really confusing and it is a thing a lot of people um, struggle with. So, so I have a few thoughts that occurred to me about return levels. Um, so, I mean, people are familiar with odds, aren't they? They're familiar with betting odds. You know, uh, they know that 100 to 1 outsider in, on the horses or, or whatever is a, is a long odds. And I wonder if... Um, I wonder if one fairly simple way to explain return levels is just with those kind of odds that, you know, it's a thousand to one that this event would occur in this year, let's say, or something like that. That might be uh, something that helps people understand it in terms they might be more familiar with. I think one of the things about quantifying the impacts and, and I, I so I, the first thing I'll say is I, I think it's a really great, um, a really good idea to take these case studies of um, past um, extreme events and see how they might look under future climate change. I think that's a really powerful way to go. So I'll just voice my support for that. Um, following up with, with what Ben was saying, I think one of the one of the slight difficulties with the risk framework, one of the challenges is that um, the, the coastline has been adapted around the UK and in many places um, to mitigate damages from extreme events. So it's not it's all not always that easy to really put everything in terms of the kind of what's the additional risk from sea level rise now because um, you've got this coastal adaptation thing which is obviously trying to mitigate damages often with historical events so there is probably a bit of work to do to try and disentangle that a bit um, but yeah um, I, I totally agree that finding finding uh, more intuitive ways of expressing some of these things um, would definitely aid the communication, I think. So that goes nicely into um, decision support, maybe. And I think Charlotte is twitching uh, with a question around policy. So over to Charlotte. Yeah, thank you, Jenny. Um, we've had a great question in um, from the audience. Um, so uh, what do you as physical scientists feel that um, politicians and elected leaders um, having communicating uncertainty involved in scientific process when discussing the future and climate mitigations. So what responsibility do you feel that politicians and ele elected leaders have in the communication? The 
great question. It's near. Pause for thought. Please do. Um, well, while everybody's thinking, I'm going to say, um, well, yes, our leaders do need to communicate because if they don't, who's going to get those messages out there? Um, so scientists do a lot of good work. Uh, they try and promote their work and publicise it, uh, perhaps through news articles, Twitter, um, blogs, uh, but we can't communicate on our own. Uh, so our leaders, it is part of their role to get the message out to the nations that they're in charge of. Um, so I think, yes, there is an important role, uh, but then how do we go about making sure they have the information they need to communicate? So I'm going to kick off with the, that as a response. Maybe I can add to that. Um, well, I think for sure uncertainty should never be an excuse to not do anything. And I, I think politicians know better than that, but maybe sometimes they're a bit short sighted because of their four year term. It's a bit hard maybe to make decisions for the coming decades. Um, yeah, climate change is uncertain, but we still need to act and we need to act now if we want to prevent uh, a disastrous outcome. So that would be my advice to them to take on the responsibility to do so. I think Matt wants to add to that. Thanks. Yeah, so I, I think um, maybe I'm slightly dodging the question, but I think um, so, so the AR6 working group one report has just come out. Um, I think it's very clear that the case for mitigation action to reduce or minimize the worst future impacts of sea level rise has never been clearer in the science. There's never been an assessment report that's come out that's illustrated that so clearly. Um, so I think in, 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 in some ways, although there are uncertainties, uh, it is very clear the agency that the current generation has to, um, to minimize the risk and I think um, the other thing that, that is very clear, I think, is the long term commitment that, that will be in store. Um, and, and I guess that's why. So what, what, what I mean by that is that even with even if we were to dramatically reduce carbon dioxide emissions now um, in line with the Paris Agreement targets, we would still have to adapt um, to a substantial amount of sea level rise. Um, and so the risk that we avoid is that those very large levels that I alluded to in my presentation. So that's the incentive to do to kind of do something. And um, yeah, so I think in some ways, maybe it goes back to the point that there, there are some things that are quite clear, even if there's uncertainty in all these future uh, kind, kind of uh, trajectories. I think we understand, uh, I think we understand the the in broad terms, we understand how future emissions map onto the risk outlook, if you like, in broad terms and the amount of adaptation that will be required. Okay, I think we've probably got one more time, one more last question before we wrap up this session. Um, and I'm going to ask the panel, how do we quantify the impact of uncertainty to decide which process in a model we target to have the most impact at improving our predictions. So does anyone fancy having a go at answering that one? Yeah, so I'll make a comment and I, I mentioned this briefly earlier. So so for us, um, sensitivity analysis is, is vital for, for doing that. So um, and that there's a range of techniques that, that you can apply, but essentially what you're doing when you you apply those techniques is you say, well, we, we've got this much uncertainty on our, our output and what's the best way um, to, to reduce that? So the uncertainty analysis tries to break down that um, distribution and attribute saying, well, is it the extremes uncertainty or is it the bathymetry is it the structure geometry is it the overtopping model the wave model so it, it tries to allocate um a proportion of the uncertainty to the model inputs so it's a very good indicator for um 
and a good indicator for things like model improvements, um, improving a physical process within a particular model or collation of, of data, if, if that's the limiting factor. So I think for us, sense, sensitivity, sensitivity analysis um, is, is, is key, uh, is a key tool for that, to answer that particular question. Go, go for it, Matt. So, so I can, um, I mean, so I, th I think right now we have some, so I'm, I'm going to talk about mean sea level again. Um, so I think we have a good idea about what the uncertain processes are. It, it does depend on time scale, as, as I said before, um, but we know that the ice sheet response is the dominant uncertainty once we get to about 2100 and thereafter. Um, what I would say is that, um, and, and it kind of resonates with some of the discussion that we've had, is there's, to some extent, some of these uncertainties are um, um, irreducible. We, you know, we, we, there will always be some uncertainty, I think. I, I think a key element moving forward is that we really need to monitor in, in kind of real time what, what the trajectory of the Antarctic ice sheet is doing, what the other components of sea level rise is doing, both globally and regionally. So at the sites of interest, what how are those components manifesting? And I think, you know, to be able to traject, uh, sorry, to be able to monitor the trajectory of the observations in the context of the projections that we that, that we have is 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 a key part, um, because it tells us whether we're on track for what you know, whether we, well, it's one way of validating the projections in one sense, but another thing is to say, where do we sit? Where where does planet Earth sit within that, within those projected um, uh, plumes or whatever you want to call them, you know, the, the um, those future time series that I showed. So I think that's a big part of it, that this, this, you know, the combination of model projections and OBS together to give us the best information. Thank you very much for that answer, Matt. Um, so I'm going to close the session there. It's been really great. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our panellists for the discussion this afternoon. And I'd also like to thank the audience for all of their questions and also for taking part in the word cloud and the, uh, the polls that we had live. So I hope you enjoyed this afternoon. Big thank you to everyone. Especially thank you to Charlotte Lydon for organising this whole session for us. And I hope many of you will be coming back tomorrow um, when there's going to be an interactive workshop uh, that's going to be talking about communicating risk. So thank you ever so much, everyone. Um, do join in again tomorrow.